Um, so in this talk, we will hear about uh, what UEFI is, um, how it can be used, and how it can be executed on, in user space. And our speaker is uh, Jethro Beekman. And um, stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm a PhD student at uh, UC Berkeley, and in my copious amounts of free time, I like to reverse engineer things. Uh, in particular, this time, I reverse engineered UEFI, which is a, the modern BIOS replacement. And um, in this talk, I will discuss some tools that you can use, that you too can use to reverse engineer UEFI, including some tools that I wrote and tools that other people wrote. So this whole project started when I bought a new SSD for my laptop. And as you might know, modern SSDs have built-in encryption capabilities. Um, whether this is secure or not is a, a question, is a good question, but really reverse engineering SSD firmware is a talk for another day. So I decided to use this description um, and uh, use it using the built-in uh, hard drive password option of my UEFI firmware. Uh, this is the password I chose, 64 characters, correct horse, battery, staple, galaxy, piece, position, require house. This is very secure, obviously. Um, so this all seems to be working fine, and uh, I was trusting that my hard drive was encrypted properly. Um, but once you start to think about how this actually works, there's, you know, a small discrepancy, really, because um, the way this password is input into the hard drive is using the uh, ATA security feature set, the security unlock command. And if you look at the unlock command, you clearly see that the password is supposed to be 32 bytes. How are these 64 characters turned into 32 bytes? That is my question, because if my laptop dies, but my SSD is still you know, functional. I want to be able to take my SSD and put it into another computer to get access to my data. I tried all the standard things like uh, truncating it or using a standard uh, hash function like SHA-256 that has 32 bytes output, uh, but these things all didn't work. So then I decided to, you know, really dive into the firmware and to figure out how it works. So this talk could also be called How to Turn 64 Characters into 32 Bytes. So what are some challenges when reverse engineering UEFI? So first of all, this is the first thing that runs when your computer uh, is booted up. So this means you will not be able to use a standard debugger. Surely, uh, people who develop uh, firmware for a living have some kind of hardware debugger, um, but that's unlikely to work on a commodity system such as this laptop, which is what I got from the store. Um, maybe you think you can emulate the firmware uh, using QEMU or something like that, but the hardware that the firmware is designed to support is unlikely to be correctly emulated by QEMU. So that is also not, probably not a viable uh, way to debug this. Also, because UEFI is basically one big process, um, is one address space, um, there is no operating system, so there are no system calls. Uh, also, there's no dynamic linker, uh, so there are no dynamic symbols. Uh, there's no symbol table that you can use as a starting point in your reverse engineering. You know, if you were uh, reverse engineering a uh, standard password utility on, uh, in user space or something, you might start at the read system call for, um, that would be displayed to the user uh, to enter their password. But in UEFI, you know, that is not an option. And even though there's no dynamic linker, the whole firmware consists of 281 different modules in my case, and it could be similar numbers uh, on your UEFI laptop. And these modules all need to interact in some way. Um, so let's take a look at the different modules. Uh, there's this tool called UEFI tool, uh, written by Nikolai Schley, and this is really should be in your bag of tricks if you're interested in doing anything with UEFI firmware. 
So um, here we'll just uh, go and use UEFI extract, which is um, a, co a command line utility included with UEFI tool that allows you to extract a, a firmware blob. So in this case, I took the firmware blob from the Lenovo uh, firmware update um, CD, and we're going to extract that. After extracting it, you, know, you get this nice directory structure with one subdirectory per, um, per module. And you, as you can see, there's quite a few of them. Here, there's a system management mode control module, some timer module, things like that. And as you can see, there, each module has a bunch of subdirectories with, for the different sections that are included in that module. And one that occurs a lot is the PE32 plus image. This is the portable execution image. This is the same format that Windows uses for its executables. So you might think you might be able to run uh, these modules. And that is true. Um, but first, let's take a look at um, what happens when you run a module like that. Each module has an entry point main. And um, the main function gets passed in this, a pointer to the system table. The system table is just uh, struck, uh, contains more pointers to other structures. Uh, for example, for the, con for the terminals, console in, console out, standard error, just for standard uh, text input and output, and also um, the boot services structure. The boot services structure contains a bunch of function pointers, including these install protocol interface and locate protocol functions. The install protocol interface allows a module to install a protocol interface um, using specified by a particular GUID, and the interface is then specified by just some, uh, some pointer. Then later, another module can call a locate protocol function with the same GUID, and they will receive a pointer to this interface that was previously installed by the other modules. So most modules in their main function start by um, loading a bunch of protocols, and then after that, installing one or uh, more of their own protocols. This is all done at runtime. So there's really no static way of uh, viewing the dependencies between the different modules. Luckily, we might be able to execute these modules, as I was alluding to before. You know, these modules, they're written for the hardware that you're currently using with your current operating uh, system. Um, so they have a compatible instruction set. So in order to execute them, you just need a compatible application binary interface, or ABI. And this is what I've written with the EFI PE run tool. You can think of EFI PE run as wine for EFI. Just like wine allows you to run Windows applications on Linux, EFI PE run allows you to run EFI modules on Linux. So EFI uh, PE run has a bunch of features. Uh, it includes many of the standard uh, EFI APIs, and it's very easy to add uh, implementations for, for uh, missing APIs. Also, at runtime, uh, missing APIs will be generated automatically with some stub functions. Uh, it supports memory map annotations so that um, you can see uh, which parts of memory have been allocated by which module. And uh, you can all run this in your standard debugger uh, environments uh, like GDB. Also, as an interesting aside, I think this is the only project I could find online that uses the cross-standard arc header, which is used for um, calling variable argument functions across calling conventions. So let's do a little demo of EFIP run. <laughs> um, in this demo, I will just um, run um, EFI PE run on each different module to see which other modules it interacts with. Um, so I just wrote this little Ruby script which traverses the directory tree that we just saw uh, from the uh, UEFI extract utility, and then it executes uh, EFI PE run on each different module. Um, we oui. a 
assertion error that I've never seen before. That's always fun. Um, as you can see, 281 processes are launched. Uh, most, process, uh, most modules return from their main function normally, but some of them uh, get stuck in an, in, in an infinite loop. Um, so EFIP rerun will automatically terminate after 10 seconds in this case. Let's look at the output uh, of all these different uh, EFIP rerun modules. Um, you can see a bunch of them segfault, which you know can be is, is understandable um, because they might be expecting s some memory setup from the early boot that is not uh, existent anymore. But there are a bunch of modules that do work, um, such as System Boot Manager. Um, you can see that uh, it prints out a bunch of stuff, um, like version information, copyright information. Then it requests a protocol. Um, this protocol has a GUID that is specified by the EFI specification, so we can um, interpret that GUID. And then um, it calls some uh, stub functions that we have not implemented. And then afterwards, it installs its own protocol, which is also a protocol specified by the EFI specification. Uh, another interesting module is the system splash module, um, which we see over here. Um, as you can see, um, it actually requests a bunch of protocols that are not implemented by EFI PE run, and you will see it will automatically generate a, a dummy interface for that uh, purpose. And then you will see that it calls a function in this dummy interface that was created here, um, namely function number two. Um, and uh, because we are unable to handle that function, uh, we just abort. Okay, so now that I've shown you uh, that we can run these different modules, we really need to get started with the reverse engineering of my BIOS to figure out how to turn those 64 characters into 32 bytes. You might remember this picture from slide two. You can see that there is a little graphic displayed in the password prompt. So this graphic needs to be stored somewhere in the BIOS, and it needs to be, there needs to be code to display this um, graphic to the user at some point. So let's take a look at the different modules that might have something to do with images and graphics and things like that. It turns out there's only four of the 281 that have a file name that seems to correspond to something with graphics or images. And of these, uh, the first module is called by another module which is Lenovo Prompt Service. And Lenovo Prompt Service contains in, its, in one of its data sections this image over here. So now we've know, we know that we found something that has to do with the password prompt. This prompt service module is called by only one other module, which is the Lenovo Password CP module, which probably means something like password control panel or something like that. Um, the password CP module also calls into three other modules, namely the sound service module, presumably to play beeps if the user does something wrong while entering their password, uh, the translate service module, which is used to translate characters, uh, or which I reverse engineered and is, um, I figure out that it's used to uh, translate keyboard char or ASCII characters back into keyboard scan codes. Keyboard scan codes are codes that are assigned to each different key on your keyboard. It's the way that hardware, your hardware keyboard communicates with your computer. And then there is the Lenovo Crypt Service module, which turns out to be a standard SHA-256 hash function. All right, so let's do another demo in which we are going to call uh, one of the functions in this Lenovo password CP module. So EFIP eRun allows you to uh, write code to interact with the EFI modules that are loaded at one time. Um, so here I've written this Lenovo specific debug module. And you can specify two functions that are, will be called. The first function in it will be called before all the P, uh, EFI modules are loaded. The second function will be called after all the EFI functions are loaded. So in this case, we'll first call the install something function and then call the after loading the EFI modules to call something function. The uh, install function uh, installs a stub Lenovo crypt service protocol. Um, this is necessary because the standard Lenovo crypt service calls into system management mode to do the hashing, which is currently not possible from Linux user space. 
Um, the second function, call a Lenovo password CP 8 cc will determine the address of the function in the Lenovo password CP module at offset 8 cc and then call it. It will take two parameters, in and out. In, we will use the Unicode string my password, and for the output, we'll just pa pass this uh, array buffer. Then um, we'll just print the output of this buffer after calling the function. So as you can see here, um, the Lenovo Translate Service module installs this protocol E3, A, B, et cetera. And then later, the Lenovo Password CP module requests this pro the same protocol, E3, A, B, et cetera. Um, also, um, you will see that the Lenovo Password CP module requests the protocol C, uh, sorry, 7, 3, E4, et cetera, which is the Lenovo Crypt Service protocol that we installed earlier. Then it does a bunch of memory operations, and at the end, we get the output. So I reverse engineered this uh, function at offset 8cc, and it turns out that um, it is, in fact, the following function. It takes the, uh, the input password and converts it into scan codes. And then it pads it to 64 characters. And then it takes the SHA-256 hash. And then it displays the first half of that. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, <laughs> so we have reverse engineered to the first pa half of the password algorithm. Uh, it took me about three weeks to decode the entire algorithm, and here it is. So this is the hash that we just saw of the password, and then this hash is concatenated with the serial number and the model number of the hard drive. That all is then uh, hashed again, and that is then passed to the SATA drive um, over the ADAP protocol. Now this is actually quite a good idea, because this means that if you um, sniff the uh, password over the, on the SATA bus, you will only be able to then later unlock the same drive because other drives, even though they might be using the same password, will have a different serial number and model number, uh, so this hash will not work for them. Unfortunately, the algorithm is a little more complex than this. The password hash, as I said, uh, actually uses the scan codes of the password, which means that there is no distinguishing in case of the letters. Also, after hashing it, it truncates it to only 12 bytes, which means that there's a maximum of 96 bits of entropy in this, pass, um, in this password hash. So this is quite unfortunate, um, but most, pass, most like human passwords have less than 96 bits of entropy, entropy to start with, so it's probably not that big of a deal. Okay, then uh, again, the, uh, this part of the hash is concatenated with the serial number and the model number, except the bytes are swapped. I really can't figure out why the bytes are swapped here, but it probably has to do something with the fact that the ADA protocol uses 16-bit words, while this, these uh, model number and serial number are 8-bit character streams. So maybe they did some engine um, mess up or something like that. All right, so in this talk, I've shown you how you too can reverse engineer UEFI um, with some tools that you can use in this, including the EFI PE run tool, which allows you to run EFI modules in Linux user space. The code of this is, of course, available uh, under GPL license on GitHub. And if you want to read about the second part of the reverse engineering of the algorithm, you can find more information on my blog. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Jethro. And we have more than 10 minutes of time for Q&A. Is there a question from the internet? Signal Angel. Um, not right now. And do we have questions in the audience? Please line up at the microphones. And we start with microphone two, please. Thanks a lot for uh, making your tools available. As someone else who does a lot of UEFI reversing, I 
been through similar rabbit holes of trying to track this down. Uh, you mentioned that SMM is not supported, and I, I assume also the real mode and the transition into long mode is not supported. Is that on your roadmap or something that, that you're interested in continuing development on? Um, yeah, I'm interested in it, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how to do it, um, especially calling into system management mode. Um, the protected mode should probably be uh, you know, also possible. The, currently, I'm also doing a 64-bit mode, but um, yeah, if anyone wants to help me implement it, obviously, I'm, uh, welcome, uh, I welcome your, um, your support. OK, and from the internet, please. Yes, the intent wants to know what is the advantage of like UEFI, uh, UEFI uh, compared to Core Boot. I'm sorry, I didn't. The internet wants to know uh, what is the advantage of UEFI compared with Core Boot, for example. The advantage of UEFI compared to what? To Core, Core, Boot. Core, Boot. Core Boot. Core Boot is oh, open okay. source well, BIOS Core Boot replacement. Is, is UEFI. Core Boot is the like Intel's open source implementation of UEFI. Uh, actually, well. Actually, it's not. Oh, it's not. No, that's no. Tiano Core. You're right. Um, the, well, the advantage is, um, I don't know what the advantage is. This is just what's supported on my laptop, so that's what I was interested in. Yeah. <laughs> OK, microphone three, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. Have you looked at any other firmwares besides uh, your Lenovo? Uh, I have not personally, but um, I, I, I know of other people who have. OK, four, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, how did you came out how to um, get the password, uh, the hash, with the, uh, with the combination of the, the serial number and the module number? So um, the full details of this are in my blog post, but in short, uh, there is a uh, EFI protocol for talking uh, to the hard drive, which is the um, ADA support protocol, if I remember correctly. Um, there's a special module. Uh, there are only a few modules that invoke this protocol, um, so I just um, r like disassembled those and looked at what they did and what commands they sent to the ADA drive. Thank you. And there is another question from the chat. Yes, uh, the chat wants to know if you found Anna, uh, any other like unexpected bugs and if it is possible to check UEFI uh, code, for example, will, uh, when running it with Wellgrind or something. Um, I've not really run into any other unexpected bugs, but I must say I was also really wasn't looking for them. Okay, two, please. Um, I have little understanding of EFI, but I had the idea to look into trying to get um, boot ROMs from uh, PC graphic cards to be running on a Mac OS computer, uh, old Mac Pros when they still were having cards pluggable. And um, I was wondering, I wanted to figure out uh, these cards run apparently uh, the old BIOS uh, real mode mode and, and I wanted to figure out if I can write a stub that gets loaded by the EFI system and then that and my code would then invoke the initialization boot ROM for the graphics card and provide the functions. Would your tool set would that help me in tracing that while my Mac is running because I can't do it while it's booting? Um, I don't it sounds like a quite a complex setup. I, I think it would be possible to write an EFI module to do what you're saying, but I'm not sure if you will be able to run that um, while the operating system is also running. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm happy to talk more uh, offline to discuss your specific situation. OK, and microphone three, please. Hi. Um, have you looked into using serial ICE for emulation of uh, the UEFI, which is essentially QEMU, but it has does forward all the hardware accesses to real hardware, so you can just trace it and run arbitrary BIOS or UEFI code in it? Uh, I have not looked into that, but that sounds a very interesting avenue to explore. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I see no more questions. Thank you to our speaker.